Rob is uh, with uh, FHWA, and he is a uh, long-term bridge uh, performance program coordinator. Rob received his PhD from the uh, University of Texas at Austin, and he has uh, over 20 years of experience as an educator, designer, consultant, and a researcher. And now managing the long-term bridge performance program at the Turner Bank, Turner Bank uh, Highway Research Center. Please welcome Rob. First of all, thank you for uh, providing the opportunity for me to come and talk a little bit about the Long-Term Bridge Performance Program. I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about deterioration modeling, but uh, Dick Dunn, who's with one of our contractors, was also supposed to come and give a quick update on the program, so I've kind of mixed that in with what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'll, I wanna start out um, just really by talking about some of the various projects that we're involved in with the uh, LTBP program and our various contractors. We currently have five contractors. Um, Rutgers University has been the lead contractor since the program was initiated. Uh, they're under one contract. We also have an additional contract where uh, PB, Michael Baker, PSI, and Pannoni are all under that contract. Um, Rutgers has been the uh, primary driving force behind developing our data-driven deterioration modeling. They've also been the driving force behind the bridge portal. Um, I do want to mention the bridge portal very quickly. If you haven't seen or heard of the bridge portal, um, it's, it's certainly a wonderful tool. Um, it's something that we are continuing to enhance all the time, and that is where uh, our, our data-driven deterioration modeling will reside. Um, I'm not gonna go through uh, all of the specific things here. Um, essentially, Rutgers is more of a programmatic uh, contractor. They're looking at the big picture and developing framework for the program, those types of things. Uh, PB, Michael Baker, PSI, they really have been doing some data collection in various areas. PB, Northwest and Southwest clusters, uh, visual inspection, Michael Baker, two Gulf clusters, uh, visual inspection and material sampling. PSI was doing something that we've termed legacy data mining. Um, most likely some of the folks here in the room have been contacted by some of our contractors. The legacy data mining is essentially um, a process where we go out and collect as much documentation as possible on the bridges that are candidates to be part of the program and we take all of that documentation and extract a whole lot of information from that documentation. The purpose is if we can answer some of the questions um, that have been put forth, forth by the program looking just at some of this legacy data, then we don't have to move into the field to answer a particular question. So that's, that's really part of the reason behind it. The other part of the reason behind performing the legacy data mining is when we want to get a solid understanding and characterization of deterioration over time, we really need to know a lot of information about how a bridge was designed, what materials were used, when it was constructed, uh, geometric uh, considerations for the particular design. So we, we gather a whole lot of information. As an example, um, I think uh, it was either for pre-stressed multi-girder bridges or steel multi-girder bridges. For one single bridge, we're extracting somewhere around 700 pieces of data. So, and that ranges from material specifications, material properties, design codes that were used just across the board, all kinds of things. Um, Pannoni uh, really provides technical support to the program as opposed to um, out collecting data. Currently, um, probably the most important thing, in my opinion, that they're working on right now is the acquisition of uh, four rabbits for the program. I'm going to talk a little bit about the what the rabbit is in case you haven't heard um, heard about that. Uh, this is this is kind of a schematic of the commercialized version of the rabbit. Uh, rabbit essentially stands for robotic assisted bridge inspection tool. Um, it's meant to automate the assessment of bridge decks. Now 
what we need for our program, our program is a research program. Um, we fully recognize that some of the technologies um, may not necessarily be appropriate for everyday use by some of the departments of transportation. However, um, I have learned recently that uh, some states are working towards developing a pooled fund program to purchase one of these systems and a customized system. Um, and that's something that the individual states will share. Uh, just very quickly, as far as the rabbit goes, and, and kind of dovetailing into what Shane talked about a little bit earlier, there really is no one non-destructive evaluation technology that's going to tell you everything you need to know. And that's part of the reason why we developed this system. Um, we have uh, impact echo, we have ultrasonic surface wave testing, we have uh, GPR, we have electrical resistivity, and we also have um, high resolution imaging on the front of the system that as the system moves along and snaps pictures, all of the data, not just the pictures, but all of the data is sent back to what you see over on the left side, which is the uh, command center, which actually transports the rabbit, but in the front of the command center are all of the computer systems. So all of that information is sent back to the rabbit so that we are back to the command center so that we essentially get a near real-time image of what's happening in the bridge deck um, by using all of these different technologies. As far as the high-resolution imaging, it's not so much what the imaging provides you, the software that goes along with the rabbit, also can detect and map cracks down to one millimeter wide. So every time the rabbit is used on a bridge, we get that photographic documentation. And when we go back the next time, we can see how things have changed. Um, a quick photograph where the rabbit is actually being uh, constructed. We developed two prototypes under the program. This now is the commercialized version. This is something that um, any state DOT can go to this company and purchase one of these systems. Um, I do believe the company, uh, it's called Infratech. They may also be um, setting up a uh, service-based um, uh, type of functionality for assessing bridge, uh, bridge decks out in the field. So uh, next thing I want to just touch on real quickly is the bridge portal. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time here to give a demonstration of it. Um, the bridge portal has been available since last October. Um, and uh, we are in the process right now of deploying an update. It should be within the next two weeks or so. I was informed last night that update should be available. Um, you can access the bridge portal. Anybody can access the bridge portal if you are uh, with a state or county government, if you're a government employee, you can actually go through the process of obtaining what are called ORC credentials. It's basically performing a background check so that you can get into the portal uh, through a system that it's behind FHWA firewall. It's through a system called UPAC, the User Profile Access Control System. The reason for doing that is sensitivity of some of the information. We don't want uh, some of the information to be accessible by general public, for instance. There may also be sensitive information that has been provided by a state that that state doesn't want other people to see. So we have the ability to limit um, the various tools and functionality as well as the data within the portal. Um, that being said, you, if you're with a, uh, a government entity, you can get your ORC credentials. If you're not, you can still gain access to the bridge portal. Um, if you are interested in information on how to access the portal, um, you can, I'm sure, get my contact information here and just shoot me an email and I'll provide you the information on how to actually access the portal. Uh, what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about is, uh, is analysis um, within the program and I want to talk specifically about the deterioration modeling that we're doing. Um, over the past couple of years, we've gone in a certain direction with developing a data-driven deterioration modeling approach. However, about three or four months ago, uh, Rutgers University 
brought in a small team of experts in this area and really looked at the work that we're doing and the direction that we're um, moving towards. And that's really what I want to, I'm going to talk a little bit about is this revised framework and then I'm going to talk about the actual data-driven deterioration modeling. Um, key on underlying assumptions, time is the most significant influence over bridge performance. Uh, availability of NBI and NBE data, that data may have errors, it may have variability, but there isn't any bias in that data. That means that predictions that are derived with that data, on average, represent true behavior. The framework characteristics uh, for what we're putting together within the LT uh, LTBP program. Um, the uh, framework, it's adaptive. It has the ability to learn. It's really a learning type of, you can, I guess some people would maybe think of it as sort of like a neural network or artificial intelligence, that's not really what it is. It's a probabilistic based learning approach. Um, it's comprehensive. It's cast in general terms, so it's applicable to a diverse set of performances and it's very efficient. Makes use of all of the diverse data that's being collected by the LTBP program. In addition, it can also make use of existing data, NBI, NBE, and so on. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. So essentially, what we're doing is we're taking a two-pronged approach. We have a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. The top-down approach essentially makes use of data that's available across the entire population of bridges located within individual clusters. Now, the LTBP program, some of you may not be familiar with it. What we've done is we've looked nationally at uh, different climatic regions, and we've developed 14 bridge clusters around the entire country. and. Um, we're also looking at 10 major corridors, five east-west, five north-south. The bridge clusters are broken down essentially into four main types of bridges. Those bridges that we have the uh, largest population of in the national inventory. Um, that's steel multi-girder bridges, pre-stressed concrete multi-girder bridges, and Bo concrete box, bri box beam bridges, but that's really broken down into uh, pre-stressed adjacent box beams and cast in place post-tensioned box girders. So there's really four types, but uh, with respect to NBI, it doesn't distinguish between the last two, so there would be three types. Um, the top-down approach, it employs a probabilistic or a deterministic model, very much like what we're used to seeing. It ex essentially provides a broad context to compare bridges that uh, are subjected to higher resolution data collection. Then the bottom-up approach is to make use of data that's available, the legacy data I talked about, um, visual inspection, non-destructive evaluation uh, that we're collecting, uh, structural health monitor monitoring data, material sampling data. Um, in some cases, the bottom-up data may need to be translated into that NBI or NBE scale to be located um, uh, with respect to the top-down model, so everything works together. Um, through comparison with the top-down model and using the data, we can actually estimate the level of under or over performance that we're seeing. Um, this, this methodology it provides a wealth of data and information to develop and validate quantitative explanations as to why certain bridges over or underperform. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this process. The top-down deterioration model, modeling approach typically would include either a deterministic or prob probabilistic type of approach. Um, several of them you've already uh, heard about this morning and you're probably quite used to seeing them. Uh, determinist deterministic models are heuristic-based models um, that uh, have been used perhaps in other countries. Mar uh, probabilistic models, Markov, Weibull, one that you see here that you probably don't recognize, uh, Haotian, that's actually the individual who recently left Rutgers um, who has developed the uh, data-driven modeling that I'm going to talk about. However, um, he also worked very closely with another individual that was working on the data-driven modeling to work towards the development of a learning approach for a cost analysis model. Um, 
So we still have somebody at Rutgers who's working uh, very closely with us on this. Um, typically, you know, what you see here is a, a typical, and we're saying deck performance here, but you can have a lower bound and an upper bound and a pretty good spread there. Um, what we're really after is to try and reduce that spread. So direct use of NBI or NBE data or um, other data such as uh, NDE data. What we actually find is that, um, I thought maybe I would have, there it is. Um, we may see in this case that it's actually uh, underperforming, and what we're doing is we're essentially quantifying that amount of underperformance, if you will, by using some of the data that we're collecting. Now, uh, to quantify explanatory variables, some of the environmental inputs, freeze-thaw cycles, hot-dry cycles, temperature range, temperature gradients, I'm not going to go through and read everything that's on here, but the important thing here is that the framework that we're developing through LTBP is meant to utilize all different types of data. It's not limited to just NBI or NBE. We can use NDE data, we can use visual inspection data. We can pretty much whatever you can think of that we can fit it, we, we would be able to fit into this uh, type of procedure. Now, um, explanation for observed over or under performance, the bridge specific inputs and attributes, environmental input, live load, preservation, um, uh, design, structural characteristics, construction quality. Uh, we can then identify correlations between the inputs and the attributes and over and under performance. So one of the key things here is data. We're in the process now of really starting to collect data. Um, in the field, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, but as more data becomes available, this bottom-up approach combined with the top-down approach will eventually become much more reliable. At this point, we don't have a lot of data, so the reliability of, of the models that we may come up with may not be terrific. But as more data is available, that reliability certainly will increase. Um, uh, and again, I've talked a little bit about this. Um, I'm not going to go into, uh, I, I will mention very quickly what is also shown here on this slide is at the bottom it says the BEAST. The BEAST is a facility that was developed at uh, Rutgers University with their uh, Kate funds and um, funds from New Jersey DOT. It's essentially a very large environmental facility where they can build a 50 foot long, 28 foot wide bridge and subject it to varying environmental conditions and loading. So it also has a 60 kip load that moves back and forth on the bridge. They can put salt spray on it. They can, uh, anything essentially you can think of, they can do it. The reason why I'm mentioning this is we're looking at um, potentially working with states to develop uh, various pooled fund studies to look at the different bridge types that we're investigating and to place them into that beast facility and within a maybe one or two year period of time we may, may be able to fully characterize that deterioration curve then take that information out for that particular bridge type and validate it out in the field with data that we're collecting in the field and see how well that works in terms of the uh, forecasting capabilities of deterioration modeling. Um, now what I'd like to talk about is the actual data-driven deterioration modeling that's been developed or is still in development by uh, the program. Um, it is a probabilistic approach. It is a top-down learning type of approach. Um, currently, one of the problems with data-driven type of modeling is you determine in the beginning the deterioration model that you want to use, the specification for that model, whether it's a mathematical formulation, whether it's heuristic, you determine what that model looks like in the first place. And as you collect data, you run that model and you estimate the suitability for the data. One of the problems with this is the data should really determine the model, not the other way around. So that's really the direction that we're heading, um, is to then move that over and put the data in the beginning. 
We use that data to drive the learning process. And what I mean by the learning process, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. I may skip through a couple of slides. Um, essentially, if we, well, it'll probably be better if I give you guys, give you all an example. So um, I'll go ahead and talk in general terms about how this procedure works, and then I'm gonna go through a uh, quick example utilizing uh, three different sets of data that we collected on one of our pilot bridges in Virginia. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the concept. Unlike much of, or I, sh I should say, unlike all of the deterioration modeling that's being done today, you essentially will pick a model and use that model. What we're doing is developing a methodology where we can more or less define multiple models. Here I'm showing six different models. We can define multiple models and allow the data to determine which model or models fit uh, or, or fit that actual data. So what we do is we uh, provide an initial weight to each one of the models and through a probabilistic approach, when we start with the first set of data, we try to predict the next set of data. So it's really what is the, you can think of it as what's the probability of predicting at this specific location the data that we're taking in the next round. And so we use that next set of data to update everything and when it updates, it essentially changes or updates the individual weights for the individual models. And what you'll see is you may find that 10% of one model and 33% of another model and so on all combine together to fit the data. Um, so that's where this data-driven process um, comes into play and that's where evaluating multiple models at one time to see which single or combination of models fit that data. So, um, I'll talk a little bit, um, uh, uh, and again, it's kind of abstract until I get to an actual example. Uh, so so as an example, we could look to the research community and say to the research community, if you have a particular mathematical formulation, um, let's go ahead and put that in here, and perhaps for that mathematical formulation, there are several um, parameters for each one. Well, one model can have one set of parameters. The next model can have, for those parameters, different numbers. Kind of like um, what Todd was showing where we went in and changed that beta factor and we saw some, some differences there. He, we, here, we can do that all at once and determine which actually fits that model. We can also go to practitioner experience. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility here. Um, Learning, as I said, is in the form of updating weights for each of the models, and we evaluate the probability of observing the, the new or next data set given the model that we're working with. Um, alternatively, you can think of it as how much does each of the candidate or individual models agree with the data. It updates the weights based on probabilities those models with greater likelihood or higher probability gain more weight, meaning they agree more with the data. Um, so I wanna give a quick demonstration of uh, how this works. The Virginia Pilot Bridge, um, kind of unfortunate, I live about five, not unfortunate that I live about five miles from it, but it's unfortunate that they are right now in the process of demolishing this bridge to build a new interchange there. Uh, they're actually building a uh, diverging diamond interchange there. However, this bridge has been studied extensively by LTBP, extensively under other programs, and about uh, two or three months ago when they were demolishing one of the two bridges, we were lucky enough to work with the uh, contractor, cut out, I think it was either three or four, six foot wide, 30 foot long pieces of that bridge deck and bring them back to Turner Fairbank uh, for further studies. Actually, today, they're using those um, for validation of the first rabbit delivery, which should be in a couple of weeks. So they're actually at Turner Fairbank today with the first rabbit. Um, so, 
what I'm going to talk about in terms of this application, I'm only going to talk about GPR data, ground penetrating radar data. Um, I have examples using electrical resistivity. Um, we have examples uh, using NBI data. Um, this is just the one that for today I chose to use. Now you can see here um, the GPR test results from 2009, 2011, and 2014 on this bridge. Now, I'm pretty sure that the 2011 and 2014 were collected with the rabbit and 2009 were collected with the same technologies but with handheld instruments. And you can see in here uh, the progression of deterioration. Now you may look at this, I've had a lot of comments with this, people look at this and say, wow, over a period of five years you have that much more deterioration. This bridge deck was in pretty bad shape. Um, however, this does point out that utilizing NDE technologies will tell you a whole lot of more information than just uh, hammer sounding or chain dragging. Um, but the reason for my, my bringing this up, um, for the example that I'm going to show you today, the only variable that we're looking at is age. You may ask how, how can we determine whether vehicular loading has an impact? Um, one of the other examples that I've, I've done in the past um, actually had age and ADTT as, as two variables. And, in, and again, we can actually look at multiple models and multiple sets of parameters at one time. So in one model where we had AD, the, the factor for ADTT, I'll call it beta, um, we can make that zero and another one make it non-zero and see which one actually matches the data. And if the one that's zero matches the data, it says that traffic or vehicular loading doesn't have a whole lot to do with deterioration of the bridge deck. So that's just an example of how we can determine or how we can assess the impact of different variables on uh, performance. So the idea here is essentially we take that bridge deck, we break it down into a bunch of little cells if you want to think of it that way. And we have the ground penetrating radar data at each location at time A, and then the ground penetration data, ground, ground penetrating radar data at time B. In this instance, that's 2009 to 2011, and then 2011 to 2014. Now, that being said, this is where it starts to make a little bit more sense. So on the left side, the candidate model um, is an exponentially decaying model. You know, something that, I guess, from your perspective, would kind of look, kind of look like that. Um, on the right, it looks to be more of a linear model. So you can see there's different factors on the left side. It's e to the alpha plus beta t times the two different times plus a, uh, a statistical factor epsilon. Um, below that, you can see what we're actually doing is we're looking at three different sets of what those parameters are in, in order to determine which of these models fit the data. On the right-hand side, the same concept. We have different values for mu, for beta GPR, and for uh, sigma squared. Um, what I want to do is kind of run through this process with you all. So we assume initial weights. In this instance, we just put an initial weight on the left side of 20% for each one. And then we said 10%, 15, and 15. We could have made them all equal. It makes no difference whatsoever. So we assume these initial weights. And then through the learning process, in other words, we start with the 2009 data, and we determine statistically what's the likelihood of predicting the 2011 data. And that likelihood updates the individual weights. Now you look at this and you say, wow, well, out of six models, one of them matched the data 100%. Again, remember, we're talking about only three data points. So the reliability of something like this isn't terrific. As we collect more data, the reliability increases. Um, you may look at that and say, well, I really don't necessarily trust those results. 
This is one of the really interesting things about this, um, this uh, framework. We can actually readjust the weights at any point in time. If we have um, gone through 10 years of data and we find, well, we don't really like how this learning process is moving forward, we can go back, we can readjust the weights and start from that point forward. Or we can say, well, let's add another model in there. So let's add a seventh one in there. Let's add a seven, eight, nine, and 10 in there and drive that whole learning process. So it's extremely flexible in that we can utilize various types of data. We can modify by adding new models at any time. We can modify weight to drive the learning process at any time. So it is extremely flexible. Now, um, as an example, we can readjust those weights. The one that was at 100%, well, we'll take it down to 90% and take that 10% and spread it out over the rest of them, making it 2% for those. And we can go back through. That was with the 2009 and 2011 data. We readjusted the weights. Now we look at 2011 to 2014. We actually find the exact same result. Just interesting. Um, specifically here. Uh, I've already talked a little bit about this. We can correct those weights at any time. We can add an additional model at any time. So if I add a seventh mathematical formulation in here and I say that has 20%, then what I do is I take whatever the weights are for the remaining six, multiply them by 80% so that I have a new set of weights. And then I allow the data to drive that learning process so I can incorporate new models at any time. Now, um, another thing that we can do in looking at this example, and this is why it's a good example to explain how the process works, you can see we have five models where the weights are zero. Why not remove them and introduce additional models? So if we remove those and then we come back in, and add, since the mathematical formulation of that exponentially decaying function seemed to fit the data really well, well, why not add in three more with different values for the parameters and see what happens with the data? So it was kind of interesting when we did this. We then um, readjust, make everything 25%. With the 2009 and 2011 data, in other words, starting with the 2009, trying to predict the 2011 data, that readjusts the weights, and we find about 88% with the first one and 12% with the second one. I think it was the second one that was the one that was agreeing 100% before. Um, and then when we go to the 2011 and 2014, we can see uh, the first one goes up to about 95%, the second one's at about 5%. So you can start to see how, um, you can start to see the flexibility of the methodology, but you can also start to understand how we can utilize this to really combine several different, if you want to think of it as thought processes in terms of deterioration modeling, and kind of come up with an aggregate model, a certain percentage of this one, a certain percentage of this one, and put all of them together, and I have something that matches the data really well. Um, now, this is, this is probably even a little bit more important to talk about. We just looked at GPR data. That's only GPR data. The interesting thing about this process is we can perform multi-index learning. In other words, what I'm showing here, if we had half cell potential data, we're actually not taking half cell potential data, we're using electrical resistivity, primarily for the reason that with half cell potential data, you have to drill down into the concrete attached to the uh, reinforcement, and if we were doing that with the rabbit, we'd have a wire behind us that'd probably get tangled up and things, so we use electrical resistivity instead. Um, uh, but the point is, we could use multi-index learning with NBI, NBE, visual inspection, GPR, electrical resistivity, impact echo, all of these things at one time. So you can see what happens is, we just looked at a mathematical formulation for a deterioration model for GPR data. We could also come up with that 
mathematical formulation for half cell potential. And again, that formulation doesn't have to be one mathematical formula. We could look at a hundred different approaches, a hundred different model formulations just for GPR at one time, apply different weights and so on. There's no problem doing that. The point is we can incorporate multiple types of data or multi-index learning. Um, which is for LTBP, that's extremely important because we're gathering a lot of different types of data. Um, uh, now, it was kind of interesting, a gentleman over here who has since left, he, that last question that he brought up um, to you about uh, whether or not we could use, utilize some of, some of the deterioration modeling and um, how it would fit into load rating of a structure. Well, it's very interesting. With, with deterioration modeling, let's say for a bridge deck and element, element level, you know, it's not going to give you even, if you, even if you know, well, it's deteriorated to this point in so many years, as a structural engineer having to do a load rating, I need to know, well, I need to know more information about that. Um, well, that's where... It's not that we are doing this right now, but perhaps in the future we may be. Use it, utilizing this type of uh, modeling scenario, for instance, looking at a bridge deck, uh, using GPR data as an example. Um, if we can fully characterize where there are delaminations, how deep they are, if we can fully characterize corrosion in the reinforcement and uh, section loss in the reinforcement, but if we can utilize the deterioration modeling to forecast that into the future, perhaps we could use that information fed into some type of bridge rating uh, software. And um, I'm not saying that we're gonna go down that road, but it is certainly something that uh, might be able to be done. Now, what we are doing, um, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the modal testing, but it's probably, it's probably not worth the time in here. Um, uh, the real, real thing here is utilizing the data, getting a reliable model to be able to forecast into the future. And the direction that we're heading with that is um, that the end result would be not a condition number, but remaining service life, taking into account all of this different data, and in the end, boom, remaining service life. Now, the uh, intent is to be able to do this on a project level and also on a network level. Um, currently, where we are, there's a beta version of the deterioration modeling application for NBI and for NDE data um, for the bridge deck that's been incorporated into the bridge portal. Um, we currently have had conversations with several states um, on the East Coast, as well as Oregon and maybe one or two others, in terms of uh, providing information to us, data to us, um, allowing us to come out on their bridges to actually validate the deterioration modeling framework that we're developing. That being said, we need historical data. We were talking a little bit about this yesterday, how, how our stakeholders, how ASHTO, BRM, how LTBP, how we can all work together. Um, you know, moving forward, core element data is no longer being collected. However, it sounds like there's quite a few states who have that historical uh, uh, core data, that's something that would be very beneficial for uh, LTBP to get a hold of because we can utilize that data again. Remember, we're not, we're not stuck into using one type of data. We actually already have um, uh, done some work where we've collected some of that core element data and run it through this process. So the more data that we can get from different regions, the more it's going to help the program to better characterize and understand uh, deterioration of the bridge deck. So we need more data. Um, I'm probably out of time, so uh, let me, do I have another two or three minutes? Okay. Um, just very quickly, where we're moving with the program. Um, 
Initially, we developed uh, a list of about 20 high priority uh, performance issues that, uh, and we did that in conjunction with state DOTs a number of years ago. And we had to pare that down to six high priority issues, untreated decks, treated decks, uh, um, assessing embedded pre-stressing strands, steel coatings, joints, and bearings. So six items. Um, uh, our current focus is on tr untreated decks, bearings, and joints for both steel and uh, uh, concrete structures. We have the protocols available right now for untreated decks, steel multi-girder structures, steel coatings, joints, and bearings, but we don't have protocols at this time for assessing embedded pre-stressing strands um, and also for assessing a bridge deck with overlays, so a treated deck. So um, we have some various studies that are underway or will be underway very soon within our uh, NDE lab where we're going to be looking at what technologies are available and uh, to essentially look through overlays and assess the underlying concrete. Now it may be, especially in the instance of an asphalt overlay, it may be that we have to go from the underside of the bridge deck. Um, with that in mind, we're in the process of working on the development of a drone for quick scanning of bridge decks, sort of like Shane was talking about, uh, that will um, do uh, high resolution imaging and uh, infrared imaging. It's kind of that, that same concept that Shane was talking about, a quick scan to determine where are the areas that we need to come back with something like the rabbit to do a more in-depth uh, uh, scan. So we're in the process of performing some studies to develop the protocols for treated decks and for embedded pre-stressing strands. So our, we're kind of realigning some of our efforts right now to concentrate on untreated decks, steel multi-girder bridges, steel coatings, and bearings and joints. So that, uh, with the time that I have, that's uh, what I'm able to talk about today. If there are any questions, I would be happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate it.